Hello and welcome to an episode of Boo Dish. It's an unscripted, unbounded, and very lightly edited type of episode where we discuss things that may or may not actually be related to Buddhism. So today we're going to be talking about tabletop gaming. Is that right? This is brought about because I put one of my uh, long-time games to finally ended it this morning uh, as of recording, and that by the time you're hearing this, that'll have been several weeks ago because we work with a backlog. But yeah, uh, just today, finished one of my games. Congratulations. And how did it go? Did everybody have a good time? What did everybody think? Yeah, everyone had a good time. Um, so this is... Uh, this was a, a play test of a system that I'm developing myself. So most people, when they're talking about tabletop RPGs, the system everybody goes to is Dungeons and & Dragons. And uh, I'm actually writing my own system to do these kind of things. I have a lot of problems with D&D. And uh, so, like, it, as, so on top of being, you know, all of the stress that normally comes with running one of these games, which we can get into detail here, but it's a lot. Uh, but on top of that, I'm testing my own rule set. And so uh, I'm very pleased with how it went, basically. Everybody seemed to be enjoying the game. Uh, more than a couple, like several players wanted it to keep going, but I don't have the time for it. And uh, yeah, it was just... Everybody enjoyed it, including me, and it's rare for one of these games to actually play long enough to go to an ending, so I'm glad if, to get that done. That's excellent, and so I guess without talking, I guess without getting too complicated for a layman like myself, do you think that you could talk about the differences between the D&D system and your system? And maybe explain a little bit just for those who may or may not be familiar with D&D or with kind of tabletop gaming in general. So, but the answer to the first question there is no, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, to act, an actual explanation of my problems with Dungeons and Dragons would take hours. Sure. Um, but um, let's see. Uh, going at core differences between what I'm doing and what D&D does. Um for one, like core premise, I think the game part of Dungeons and Dragons is very poorly designed. Like it's bad, mm -hmm. and so I've gone at this. Uh, I think that that comes from a a desire to create a system that simulates a world before thinking about whether or not it's a good game design. And so with my system, I have started from the idea of what makes a good game first and then stacked rules on top of that in order to make it satisfy like make that into a system that can run one of these games. So uh for those completely unfamiliar what I'm talking about is tabletop role playing games uh it, groups of one to however many some DMs go nuts with this however many players you want plus usually one person who is designated as the game runner. So this is, you know, game master in Dungeons and Dragons. It's the dungeon master in the various white wolf systems. It's the storyteller. Uh, in my system, I call that the arbiter. This is the person who is running everything. And so uh, the players each create a character that they insert into this game runner's world and we're basically working together to tell a story. Uh, the players are the protagonists in some kind of story that the Arbiter is weaving with the player's help. And so to get back to differences between the way I do it and the way Dungeons & Dragons does it, um, Dungeons & Dragons does a lot of things uh, in 5th edition, at least, Dungeons & Dragons, which is the current edition as of this recording, um, it does a lot of things that make it uh, impossible to make a particularly strong or particularly weak character. Um, the way 5th edition is set up, there's not a lot of uh, optimization done by the players to make their characters strong. 
Um, the only real choices players get is what classes they what class they're picking. Uh, there are rules for multi-classing, but most of it like being two classes at once. But in fifth edition, those rules are not good, and it's generally a better idea to stick to one class. So that's the one choice you make at the beginning. You make a you choose your ability scores, which are prescribed like they're obvious best scores based on what character you're playing and then a couple of choices on your character towards the end of you know let me let me clap in so i'll have a note to edit this to actually be more coherent because i'm rambling real bad no that's okay this is actually all useful because as i understand it like the system in D D is like they give you uh, in addition to this choosing a class thing they give you like a finite number of points and you have to distribute those points between these different skills, which will then have an effect on how your player, how your character engages with the environment as it's laid out by the um, the dungeon master or the game runner or the game master that we're talking about. And what you're saying about that is that, that those skills and the way that you have to like distribute the points and so on is that part of what makes it impossible to make a strong or weak character because that sort of idea means that everybody is on somewhat of the same playing field right because they're limited to those different types of skills they can increase or decrease with their points and because um i don't know because everybody engages with the environment according to those skills specifically according to their class so you're ref- what you just described sounds more like older versions of Dungeons and Dragons. And fifth edition, you don't make very many choices past the char- the first character creation stage. There, like you level up, and then the game tells you what leveling up means, and you don't make any choices most of the time. And it's on it's on rails basically. Um, and the reason they do this is to keep things manageable for the dungeon master. Uh, because if in earlier editions there was the ability to really maximize the character in such a way that it was difficult for the dungeon master to plan out uh, fun and balanced in fights. Like, you, if you don't know what power level your player is, then how can you create a fight for them that works out? And then also in earlier editions, it was very possible to have a party where one character is stronger than all three other characters. And so then the dungeon master has to go, okay, I can either challenge this one person who has optimized their character, in which case the other three are not able to do anything because they're too weak to influence the fight, or... I make a count encounter for those other three players, and then the one player who's optimized completely steamrolls it. Um, past editions had, especially the one I started with was third edition, and third edition had that real bad. Um, and then in fourth, and then later fifth edition, uh, the designers made changes to make that basically impossible. Um, the only optimization you can do with the character in 5th edition is uh, you have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Different classes want different combinations of those scores. And at the beginning of the game, you get some points and set those scores. And generally, those scores don't change afterward. Um, And so you're kind of set from the beginning of your character. And then later on, after you've gained a few levels, the you get one choice of which like subclass you want to go. So like, if you start as a rogue, then later your subclass is: Do you want to be a rogue with a little bit of magic? Then you're an arcane trickster. Do you want to be a rogue who's really really good at killing people? You're an assassin. Do you want to be a rogue who's good at infiltrating places? You're a thief. And then you make those choices, and those choices are set after you make that choice for the rest of the character's progression. And then later you get a choice of either getting a feat, which is just a specialization that you can do, like an extra special thing that your character can do, or increasing one of your ability scores, the strength, dexterity, etc. 
And those are the only choices you make in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, my system has no rails, basically. Um, people can choose whatever uh, spells or attacks they want. People don't have, don't like, you know, you can very easily be um, a warrior who is also a healer at the same time and be effective at it. Um, and so kind of, I'm trying to make the character, my, basically my thesis is that my character creation system is a lot deeper than Dungeons and Dragons and a lot more, uh, so far it's been much more satisfying to my players. Like the only complaints I've had have been for things that aren't involved with the game the system. Like the players have all said that they really like this system. And I've got a s group of like seven play testers at this point. So seven out of seven is better than most of these systems do. I'm think I'm onto something here basically. Yeah. Congratulations with a hundred percent good reviews so far. I mean, that's, that's really awesome. And so like for a new player who's coming into this game, what are some of the choices that they make in their character creation as opposed to class and dexterity, charisma, wisdom, so on, and then later subclass? Is what, how are their choices different whenever they're creating their characters that are about to be dropped into this game? So I'll say that one thing that I have kept is the attribute system. Uh, I call them different numbers, but they are, uh, I, but I call them different names, but, um, so the first thing your character will decide is those attributes. For my system, they are... Um, so it's strength, finesse, toughness, mind, heart, soul. And so you arrange... Like, you get... I'll give every player... You know, you, like, you have seven points to distribute between these six categories. Tell me what your character looks like in this way. And after that, um, one thing that... I really depart from in Dungeons and Dragons is that my my game has no classes. So in Dungeons and Dragons, you would be like, I'm a fighter. I'm a barbarian. I'm a wizard. I'm a cleric. Uh, that's not really in this system. Um, I have it such that you spend your points to buy whatever enhancements you want for your character. So like if you're playing a character whose whole thing is protecting people, you can just spend all of your points in hit points and defense in order to get really tough and then stand in front of your allies in order to protect them during the fight. Or if you want to play a, you know, more spellcaster character, then you get MP uh, and mental attack and a bunch of different attacks that allow you to hit the enemies in different ways. And so, you know, that first character is really good at soaking damage, but doesn't deal much. The second character is really good at dealing damage, but doesn't really soak it well. And so these characters can come together and be more than the sum of their parts. Um, and so, you know, you're talking about, do you want to deal more damage? Do you want to take less damage? Do you want to have more health? Do you want to be able to do different types of things? Um, it's all coming from the same pool of experience points. And so it allows players to really customize things to make the exact character they want. So, for example, uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, there's really no viable way to play an unarmed fighter who relies on strength. Um, the Dungeons and Dragons has the monk class, but monk is very dexterity focused. So if you want to just punch people really hard, Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have a good solution for you. You could be a barbarian and just punch people really hard, but that barbarian punching people will always do less damage than a, that same barbarian using an axe. Um, so every playtest that I've had so far has had at least one player make a punch character that is strength-based. Because this is an archetype that a lot of people want that Dungeons & Dragons just doesn't have. So all of my playtests have had one meathead character who just goes in and decks his enemies. That's fantastic. And so it sounds like the way that you're taking the rails off that Dungeons & Dragons has on is by using this pool of experience points to buy other things. Is that something that Dungeons & Dragons has or has had in previous editions, or is that something that you are departing from them with as well? 
I'm departing from that as well. So the way Dungeons and Dragons works in progression is your characters get experience points. And then once they get enough experience points, they level up. And then when they level up, they get more HP, more abilities, more spells and all. It's very discreet. There's a big clunk between I'm level one and I'm level two. Like the level two character is approximately twice as powerful as the level one character. And then things keep going like that way where you have these long plateaus where you're not really developing your character sheet and then you level up and then everybody does all of their boosting at once. Um, and the, what you get when you level up in Dungeons and Dragons is very specifically specified, very regimented. You are, you usually are not making a decision when you level up. Um, you're really just getting stronger in your own, choices that you made at the beginning right you're getting stronger in the abilities of your chosen class or it sounds like you're getting more hp of course that's that's kind of an important part of the leveling up experience in these tabletop games but also it sounds like basically for your chosen character you're just kind of getting these blanket one size fits all upgrades for a level up rather than being able to purchase different upgrades or to choose between different upgrades or to be creative with how you use those upgrades in combination with each other to engage with the story that the game runner is laying out for you. Right. Um, it's not no choice. It's just that Dungeons and Dragons. And one thing it also does is it offers a whole lot of choices that are bad. Like you could level up, you know, you could start as a fighter and then level up and take a level of wizard. That is a choice you can make in Dungeons and Dragons. However, that is an awful choice right. because the way the classes scale, it is usually much better to be high and level in one class than be low level in several classes. There are multi-class combinations that kind of work, but uh, my, you know, I went through fifth edition and tried to make it work before I started making my own stuff. Um, and in the process of trying to make it work, every time I took multi-classing into consideration, I went, but why would I do that? Because I don't get the strong benefits at level 20 or 19 that all of these classes get. Like, you know, if you are a level 10 fighter and a level 10 wizard, the level 20 fighter is so much better of a fighter than you are that your fighter levels don't matter. And the level 20 wizard is the same thing. So that's what my, this has been a thing with Dungeons and Dragons since day one. It offers a lot of bad choices. And I have seen uh, answers from their designers saying that we think that the bad choices are a good thing we want players to have the reading literacy to know that this option is bad. So don't do that. And like, for example, they think crossbows suck. There's been multiple interviews with Dungeons and Dragons uh, developers I've heard of where they're like, why would you use a shitty le wo weapon like a crossbow? Just use a bow instead. That sucks. Yeah, that's not that cool idea at all. Yeah, that idea of adding bad choices, intentionally bad choices to your system is, like, awful. Fuck that design idea. Completely and entirely. No, that's awful. Why would you intentionally add something that's going to make a player theoretically, like, die in the game? Or theoretically just make them weaker than everybody else that they're with in the game? Like, that's... We've talked about off the show before player hostile decisions that developers can make whenever they're making a video game or a tabletop game or any kind of game. And that's one of them. Like let's willfully put in something that we decided we don't like that is weaker and inferior to anything else in the game. And then expect the player to have the basic literacy and math skills to understand that, you know, X is worse than Y and therefore they should choose Y. They don't understand that they're prescribing that someone choose Y and completely shutting out any chance of developing a creative engagement with the game through the path of X. Another problem that comes up with this system is that it relies on the designers being able to balance their own stuff, and they can't. 
Dungeons and Dragons has been an unbalanced mess for a long time. Fifth edition, I would say, is the least messy so far. I didn't really do much with fourth edition, so it might have been better. I don't know. I hated fourth edition from the get go. But um, with fifth, with the fifth edition, another problem is that they present a lot of options as being equal because they think it's equal. But when you actually put it into the game and start letting players use it, it's weak. Um, in 5th edition, the Ranger class is awful. It It's bad at everything it's trying to do. And it is presented as an equal class. And if you look through it and, you know, you're not really going through doing the math, it's going to look like, you know, oh, hey, uh, uh, like I, this is how, what I want to do if I want to be like, you know, Legolas or Aragorn, you know, those are the characters that this class inspired and like it's weak it does low damage it has no staying power like it, it can't take damage very well and it spells other with one exception that's kind of neat its spells are just weaker versions of what druids can do so you know between the system having obvious traps in it and also unobvious traps that even the designers haven't figured out. It, it it really sets players up for failure. I have seen a lot of Dungeons and Dragons fights where players just aren't able to do anything because either they've you know chosen a weak class like Ranger or Monk, both of which struggle to compete, or the dice go against them. Um, another problem that we haven't mentioned here is how Dungeons & Dragons uses its dice. 90% of dice rolls in Dungeons & Dragons are a 20-sided die. Anytime somebody's like, hey, I need to hide. Okay, roll a d20 to tell me how well you hide. I want to hit somebody. Roll a d20 to tell you how well you hit them. Uh, I want to uh, study this book. Roll a d20 to see how well you understand what's in there. Um and the problem there is the way a d20 is distributed, the worst outcome is just as likely as the average outcome is just as likely as the best outcome. And the difference between those is 1 in 20. Right. So it's a 5% chance either arbitrarily. It's a 5% chance that everything is the worst possible thing, just like it's a 5% chance that everything is the best, just like on and on it goes. It's just right. That makes for a swingy world. Yeah. A world that exists on that kind of probability distribution, people are going, people would be, you know, randomly tripping over for no reason all the time or, uh, you know, attempting to, you know, some beggar out on the street plays a loot and that they've never touched before. But they roll the 20 so they get, you know, the best audience around them. And it's it just makes for a world that swings wildly back and forth between the best and the worst all the time and it doesn't seem like it makes the player classes and the player decisions matter that much because let's say that you buff up your let's say learning if you're reading a book and you're trying to roll for how much you understand out of that book then if you still roll a one at the end of the day instead of a 20 you're still going to be screwed and so it doesn't really matter that much how you know, how you've distributed your points as you've leveled up. It just sounds like at the end of the day, if you're stuck on that, you know, one in 20 chance every single time, your decisions are virtually meaningless. So you have to have some way to introduce randomness to the system. Absolutely. And you have to have some way to cause something that a player does not like to happen to their character. Bad things have to be possible. Right. And as far as, you know, the player agency bit, you're right and you're also wrong. And Dungeons & Dragons distrib shows both ends of that in different editions. So in the current edition, 5th edition, um, they keep numbers small. Like, it, you know, a character that has plus 10 attack is a very strong character. I see. Uh, in, that, in that realm. But... Uh, because the numbers are small, that means the D20 is most of what you're paying attention to. Right. Uh, so in that case, you're right. But then in 3.5 edition, this edition I started with, they kept the numbers big. 
And it wasn't very long before he's like, I have a plus 34 to my attack roll. I really don't care what the D20 looks like after that. Exactly. So it can, so Dungeons and Dragons has literally done both extremes of the problem. And the actual problem, I think, is the D20. That's a shitty way to, you know, make to be your core randomizer. And so what I use is 2D10. And so if you can put up a graph about what different uh, dice rolls look like, but um, for the 2D10, it's a bell curve around 11. So the least likely chance in the le- the worst thing that can happen with a 2D10 is you roll snake eyes, you roll two ones. That has a 1% chance of happening. The best thing that can happen is uh, rolling, you know, 10-10, and that has a 1% chance of happening. The average is going to be 11. While you're doing that, I mean, that does sound like a much more well-thought-out means of bringing out randomness in the game, because I think that it does allow for things that the player doesn't want to happen to happen, but at the end of the day, looking at a game over its entire progress, you're not going to have a very large chance of a player just consistently rolling the worst, 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 worst outcomes for every single engagement. And in Dungeons and Dragons, the chances for doing that while still small are a lot higher because they're not small. It's, it's over a campaign. You are going to see multiple fights where somebody just does not function because the dice turn against them. I was notorious for this back when I played Dungeons and Dragons. Like I was known as somebody who was very unlucky with their dice. We even had one session where uh, it wasn't Dungeons and Dragons for this particular session, but we played a different game and did statistics, like actually graphed the results of our dice rolls. And I was bit like I was at the edge of standard deviation below average like i did real bad and we had the numbers to back it up oh that sucks yeah dungeons and dragons makes that happen all the time um there have been multiple fights where if i had been outside that fight watching i would have noted one character was incompetent and should not be allowed on the adventure more because they were going to get themselves hurt and the only reason for that is because they couldn't roll above a five wow that happens a lot like enough that I fucking hated it and decided to get out of that. But also, because of the way the rest of the system is designed, it's normalized around that 1d20. So if you change to a 2d10, it changes the way the numbers work elsewhere in the system that in a way that's unpredictable. For example, uh, this is back in 3.5 where the numbers got very big. Um, I created a very defensive character once and, uh, and one of, and the DM noting of that game, knowing me and knowing my dislike for the D20 said, Hey, what if we switch to 2D10 for this system? And I had to tell him like, I wish we could do that, but because of the way Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 edition is balanced, if you do that, I will become impossible to hurt. Because I needed, like, I took, I went to the monster entry for a monster of about my level. And because I had so focused so much in defense, that monster would need to roll a 16 or better to hit me. In Dungeons and Dragons, that has a 25% chance of happening uh, with a d20. Darks from the future splicing in here because my math was incorrect the first time I said this. On a 2d10, that has a 15% chance of happening. So they have the monster that you're fighting against has a 15% chance of getting above the level it needs to be to actually hurt you. And then whenever you're engaging with it, then those numbers are different? No, no, no. So... That monster has a set attack score, uh-huh. and I have a set defense score. Um, so the monster has to exceed my defense score to do damage to me. If 
I, my armor level was such that if he rolled a 16 on the d20 roll, he would hit me. Mm -hmm. But if you change, and, and so that's a 25% chance to happen. If you change the d20 to 2d10, then instead of a 25% chance to hit me, it has like 15% chance to hit me. So it's basically buffing you through the numbers without actually buffing your points or buffing anything like that. Exactly. Uh, because that system, because the 2d10 is more consistent and cluttered around the middle, uh, more extreme scores, you know, such as my very high defense score in this case, uh, meant that uh, the 2d10 had unintended consequences. So even though I, so you can't just fix Dungeons and Dragons by saying, let's use a 2d10 instead of a d20. Other decisions were made in that game design that uh not forbid it but make that a bad idea because if you change that and then all the other numbers are assuming a d20 then all of those num other numbers need are wrong now yeah that makes sense and so what are the chances of an 11 um with two d10s like we've been talking about 10 percent before so that's 10 percent, and then the tails are one percent so you have a 1% to roll a 2, a 2% to roll a 3, 3% to roll a 4, dot, 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 9% to roll a 10, 10% to roll 11, 9% to roll 12, 8% to roll 13, dot, dot, dot. Excellent. Like it's, it's, a, it's a curve. Right. And it clusters around 11. So with that understanding... I can distribute numbers correctly in this system in order to uh, provide a good set of monsters for my players to fight against. That's fantastic. And that makes it so that the, the game isn't really broken up into core tiles as it seems like, or I guess I, I guess I should say into these parcels of one out of 20 like Dungeons and Dragons is broken up into. This seems like it introduces a lot more curvature to the way that fights will play out and the way that character development plays out. I have, and it also still re still retains the pop off that comes with the natural twenty. Right. So in Dungeons and Dragons, the natural twenty is a critical hit. There in this system, that's two tens, and there's only a one percent chance of that happening. But I have seen that happen and turn fights around. That's awesome. So, you know, it's still there. I've also seen double ones ruin a otherwise interest, you know, otherwise promising attack. So, you know, it's it's still there, but the players don't have to go. I have no fucking idea what's about to happen every time they roll the dice. They can go, they can look at their sheet and go, I can expect around this result and then make decisions based on that expectation. And, you know, so they, it's easier and harder at the same time to judge because with Dungeons and Dragons, you can just go 5% every, every number up. So like if they need to hit me with a 13, then that's, you know, 5% for every step above. Like, it's really easy to do that math. Whereas here, every different numbers, you know, it's a curve. And it's harder to think in curves. So you've got like a number, you know, you've got a 9 and they've got an 11. And you have to decide for yourself as a player or as the game runner. Like, are, is it going to be realistic that this person's going to get above the 11 or below the 9 or so on and so forth? And it's a curve, yes. But also each chance of a role each ch like the, the statistics involved make it so that the decision making is a lot more nuanced than just okay this is you know five out of 20 this is six out of 20 this is two out of 20 and so on so it sounds like with the two d10s and with the tails each being one percent chance right rolling a two or rolling a 20 it sounds like also that pulls the player into the game with much higher emotional stakes, right? So if you get a nat 20 on 2d10s in an encounter, then because that's such a low chance of happening and because then obviously it happens so much more rarely, when it does happen, 
then I can imagine it being a lot more fun and enjoyable and hype for the person who rolls it. And then, of course, the other end of the spectrum is true as well. Since rolling a nat 2 is so rare and uh, so impactful on the game, thus, similarly, it's got to be that much more disappointing and that much more sad whenever whenever it's a dud, essentially. And um, I think that those ups and downs really make a game um, enjoyable and engaging. You know, the downs suck and the ups are great, but at the end of the day, it sounds like um, if I were going to be a player and I wanted to get involved in telling this story and involved in creating this story, then the stakes are there whenever the worst and the best outcomes are statistical outliers, whereas in Dungeons and Dragons, the best and the worst outcomes are not statistical outliers. They are always presently equally probable, you know, as um, as any other outcome. And in that regard, then it's kind of like, okay, I'll just roll my dice and continue. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't seem as emotionally intense whenever you roll a 20 or whenever you roll a one um, in the regular system. But then in your system, it makes it so that these things are much more rare and thus impactful and thus enjoyable and um, make for a much more roller coastery experience of a game in a good way. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, so natural 20s and Dungeons and Dragons are big pop offs every time. Uh, like people get invested in their 20s. Everybody wants their 20 and natural ones get this get the same kind of you know, nega pop off. Uh, so I'm not sure that that, what you just said is necessarily true. In fact, in my system, the, the two and the 20 might be rare enough that instead of a big pop off, they're more of a, Oh, Hey, that was, that's rare. And then move on. I see. So I'm not sure how true that is. I would have to ask my players that. Um, and so I can't really, like one disadvantage of the current situation is that I cannot assess the system from the player side because I'm always the arbiter for these. Sure. Um, but maybe in the future you might have the chance to hand it off, so to speak, to somebody and kind of participate as a player and see how it looks from that end and how it feels from that end. Because um, especially since you kind of created the system, I'm, I imagine it must be very hard to distance yourself from the from the role that the arbiter plays um because you kind of created the system and the role itself <laughs> the arbiter has um in in your in your game yeah i hope so one day i would love to be able to actually play this as a player and see someone else using this system um and one day that might happen i don't know uh being an independent RPG, t tabletop RPG developer, is interesting because we're kind of, whereas in other independent scenes, you might see independent artists kind of uh, pushing each other and helping each other get publicity and that kind of thing. Because the initial investment for getting into a tabletop system is so high, you have to read a long rule book to get into this. We're kind of cannibalizing each other's audiences because there's only so many role-playing systems that people are willing to learn to play. Whereas with a video game, you know, you can spend five minutes and figure out the basic controls. Uh, figuring out the basic controls in the tabletop system takes hours of reading. So, you know, it's hard to get publicity because, you know, every, it, there are so few people who are interested in looking at indie RPGs and those people don't have the time to learn all of them. So it's, it's really hard to get a big group to get this going. Well, that brings me to the next point because, um, the one thing that I wanted to ask you about has to do with um, given that this is a small audience and that you are kind of fighting extra hard for their time and their attention with other indie RPG developers. It seems like the key there then is to have a, a, a payoff that they get that's 
unique and special compared to other systems, unique to D&D, unique to other indie RPG games. And I think that one interesting thing that you've been telling me about over the course of the development of this game um, and would be a huge payoff for me if I were to play it is how you have incorporated Buddhism into the actual storytelling and into the gaming system. So do you want to talk about... No. So I've incorporated Buddhism into the one, the setting of one of my games. Mm. It's act, the Buddhism is actually not really in my system. Um, now, I think you could very easily use my system to create a world based on Buddhist ideas. Um, and you could also make this game non-violent, which is harder in other systems. So uh, you could, uh, but that's not what I've done here. I see. I see what you mean. And I, I guess I wasn't really mentioning it about like being inside the system itself, but in the storytelling and in the setting that you have given to the players, it seems like the payoff for learning a new system and participating in a new system would be some sort of richer fiction, some sort of richer imagination that comes out of it and including buddhism in the setting and including buddhism in uh some of the some of the villains that we that, that we've talked about that you fight or in some of the um possible spells or types of um things that people can buy with their experience points that seems to be um a type of payoff that people get from doing this one and not another one yes um the payoff is definitely in this system player expression. Um, because I have removed all the rails from character creation, um, you can make a very custom character that is very specific to the way you want them to play. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the thing that I hope my system has as its payoff. Uh, I will say in Dungeons and Dragons defense, its payoff is that it is relatively easy on the dungeon master. Um, in Dungeons and Dragons, there are components that you can put together to create your adventure. Like you don't have, like in Dungeons and Dragons, you don't have to write your own monsters. They have monsters written, including details like you know their character sheet like their statistics in a fight but also their ecology what they do when they're not fighting uh how they fit into the environment they live in they have all that stuff already made in a way that a dungeon master can kind of fit together like legos to create his or her or their story um so you know that's the big thing is that Dungeons and Dragons is easy on the DM. And it's uh, that's also one of the reasons why there are so many rails in place there. Because those rails make it so that you can predict what your players can do. And that can allow you to plan your session more tightly based on what those players are able to do. But my complaint on that is that there's not very much player variation like there my barbarian is going to play more or less the same as your barbarian does and there's not much i can do to change that uh unless i just want to make that character weaker there are a lot of ways i can make the character a character in dungeons and dragons weaker but not stronger um and with my system you can make your character fight or not fight exactly the way you want to um at least as much as I've been able to write so far. You can take, like, you, there's nothing stopping anyone from taking any combination of abilities in my game. Interesting. And so does that imply then that your system would be more or less amenable to having Lego pieces dropped into it? Like a ready-made monster, a ready-made uh, terrain, a ready-made something like that? It's very amenable to that. Um, and the main reason there aren't already pre-written monsters up is because of the sheer amount of writing that, that requires. takes a lot of work. Yeah. And so no one would expect you to have that ready after only having done this for what you've been doing this for like a couple of years uh, or just one year. Or? I've been working on this system off and on for over a decade at this point, oh, wow. but active development in this most recent version that 
basically came after I fully concluded that Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition was a lost cause. Uh, three ish years, I think maybe four. I see. Yeah. So that's, that's not enough time really to, unless you have a staff of developers to really write a lot of these and create a lot of these different shaped, interesting Lego pieces, right. That fit into the system in a certain way. Yeah, du- Wizards of the Coast, the people who make Dungeons and Dragons, have a lot of writers on staff. Yeah. I have myself. Right. So there's only so much I can do about the lack of p- these kind of puzzle pieces in my game. Like It's just a matter of I haven't had the time to write it yet. Sure. Uh, but my system is very modular. You could put in lego pieces like pre-made monsters you can make you pre-made settings like there's a lot of stuff you could do with this system it's just as versatile as i would say even more versatile from dungeons and dragons because dungeons and dragons expects a high fantasy world um i have i am currently the game that i still have that i'm still continuing is a high fantasy game but the game game i put to bed this morning was a sci-fi game Oh, wow. And it was using the same system and the same rules, and it worked fine. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons with the same rules and the same systems would not function in a sci-fi world very well. Uh, now, there is Spelljammer, which is basically elves in space, Dungeons and Dragons sci-fi modules. And I haven't looked at those, so I don't know if they're any good or not. But um, But they have to change something fundamentally about what they're doing, right, in order to make that work then. Um, You'd have to change the classes, or you'd have to change the the the, att- the skills or the attribute attributes or something like that in order to kind of transpose it, right? Because, I mean, first edition was intended to be high fantasy, right? I mean, this is developed by fantasy people for fantasy people, and so I can see what you're saying about how it has to transpose in a certain way. Let's see. I'm looking at some information on Spelljammer, which is the D&D's, what I just mentioned. I don't know, but I haven't actually looked into it. It looks like Spelljammer does not introduce new classes, but it does introduce new races and subclasses. So, uh, I'm not sure how, I don't have enough data, rather, to compare how modular Dungeons and Dragons and this system is. My intention is that it's much more modular, Again, I didn't change any of the rules between the sci-fi and the fantasy versions. Uh, so I'm not like I would need to actually look at what Spelljammer has in it and sure. actually un- you know understand that. And at this point you could not pay me to do anything with Wizards of the Coast's products again. I just really hate Dungeons and Dragons at this point. That would be a question for somebody who's still into 5e, so I don't have a good answer. Yeah, I mean, the other... but We don't have to derail a whole episode for this, but I'm fascinated by a Wizards of the Coast product, Magic the Gathering. And um, I have to like come in and out of that because I can see from what we've discussed so far that some of the same player hostile decisions... Uh, kind of come into play in Magic the Gathering as well in, in in certain different iterations. So those that are critical of Magic the Gathering say that it is essentially pay to win and that the rails essentially are financial ones. If you want to be strong, then you better be willing to drop anywhere from a couple of hundred dollars to like ten or twelve thousand dollars on on a deck, right? And those rails, um. The meta, I should say, in in a lot of cases, it's like from a numbers standpoint, and when I say numbers, I mean like percentage of different types of decks that are each in the meta at one time. From that standpoint, the metas typically are healthy, but from the standpoint of what those decks do and what cards those decks have, it's kind of like you're just dressing up the same basic engine with different archetypes on top based on just you liking what those archetypes look like or what they do, right? And that's a problem that I think that Yu-Gi-Oh, another card game, also suffers from. Magic the Gathering suffers from it. 
I don't know enough about Pokemon or Flesh and Blood or anything like that to know for sure about those games. But um, this kind of problem is it's done in it's done as a means, I think, to commercialize and market a game to a larger audience so that more and more people can come into it and enjoy it and be a part of it. But at the end of the day, it just makes it so that you can't really make weird, janky stuff and expect it to work. I mean, I used to play Magic the Gathering back in the day. This was a long time ago. And I remember uh, slapping down like 30 bucks each for a set of Goblin Sharpshooter cards that just completely obliterated everything else that I came up across when I finally got that, when I finally got all the cards. So there is a, like, it's hard to compare uh, TCGs like... uh, like magic to role playing games sure. because there's an inherently competitive element to it. Whereas even the dungeon master in Dungeons and Dragons is a cooperative effort with the rest of the players. Yeah. Like there there early on there were attempts but to kind of get an adversarial relationship between players and DMs, like this idea of the trickster DM who's just, you know, finding ways to pull a fast one on his players. That was there in early Dungeons and Dragons. uh, And you can see that with dungeon design that continues to this day. Um, Have you ever heard of the Tomb of Horrors? It sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay. The Tomb of Horrors is an extremely popular module that came out back in the earliest editions of Dungeons and Dragons. First edition, uh, it was a, basically a dungeon that a dungeon master could run for his players. And so um, it's a very popular module. It's been reprinted many times. And I think it fucking sucks. One of the first things that this get, that the module has is there are three rooms. One of them is correct. and one of, And the other two have horrible traps that will instantly kill you. Which one is it? And it's like, what? There's no actual thinking or figuring out to do to figure out which tomb you need to go into. It's just a matter of picking the right thing from a set of random choices. And that happens all the time in that module. It it, it represents a time from where the players were seen as trying to beat the dungeon master. And that's not really how things go anymore. It's more understood that the dungeon master and the uh, players are cooperating these days. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I've heard of people who have tried to do the DM versus players thing in later editions, and it's just gone terribly every time. Like it's just not designed that way anymore. You can't really do that. It'll just make your players angry. I would say you couldn't do that in first first edition either, and it just made players angry. Like everything you just said is are problems that I have seen in actual se- in sessions. Like it's 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 been there from the beginning. That's just not the right relationship to have for this endeavor. If we're to step into the universe, it's pretty much just like all right. There's like four or five of you against God, and yeah. you you have to figure out some way to defeat God whenever there's whenever god is actively making the environment and the game and the story hostile to you it's it's very postmodern and it's very interesting and cool in that way but when you're actually playing it's like this is just this is just a meat grinder (laughs) this sucks yeah uh don't get me wrong i am somebody who is very into killing gods in fiction like i do that a lot but uh you know, when the god is actually in control of the entire universe, the the more not you know, most of the time when we're talking about killing a god in a video game, we're talking about killing a very powerful representation of some greater force. When we're talking about, we're usually not talking about the literally omnipotent uh, version that the dungeon master is in these sessions. Exactly right. We're not talking about killing a Greek god like in God of War games. We're talking about killing the person who is in charge of the entire trajectory of time and space. <laughs> you are basically killing the setting. 
Exactly. Because that's what the the game runner is providing, the setting and everything that's not the players. So, yeah, like that could be fun if you have a group of people who are specifically looking for that. But that's not most people. Exactly. And I've not encountered that group other than like I could I, there's been a couple of times when I've been like, here's a person who would be in that group. Here is a person who could be in that group. But those are years apart in different groups. It's it, that kind of thing requires a specific type of player. And it's just not what most people are doing. Absolutely. I can totally see that. All right. Well, we've rambled for about an hour. I have no idea how listenable this is going to be when I get this back to edit, but uh, we'll see, I guess. I enjoyed the conversation, at least. Yeah, this was a good conversation, and I hope that you are able to continue to do playtests and that you continue to get successes with regards to player reviews and with regards to the progression of the game. Um, It sounds really interesting, and it sounds a lot more fun, I think, than uh, Dungeons and Dragons for a lot of reasons, or at least fun in a different way if someone still does like Dungeons and Dragons but wants to try out this new system. Yeah, I don't want to yuck anybody's yum. If you're still having fun with Dungeons and Dragons, keep having fun. I am jealous of you. Uh, but um, if you're not having fun playing Dungeons and Dragons, or maybe if you're somebody, I know a lot of people who like to play Dungeons and Dragons but hate the combat, if that's where you are, then my suggestion would be to look into other systems. Uh, mine's not complete enough for me to really promote here. Like, I'm still very much in alpha stage. But there are a lot of other systems out there that are not Dungeons & Dragons that you can try. And so, if you're loving Dungeons & Dragons, keep loving it. If you're not, try something else. There's more out there. Tabletop RPGs are not just Dungeons & Dragons. And thank you for coming to my TED Talk, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this has been a good conversation about your tabletop game system and how it differs from Dungeons & Dragons and what the implications of that are on the game. Um, join us next time for our next Buddhist episode where we will ramble on for an unbounded, unscripted amount of time about whatever we want. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. See you next time. My name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions and the voice of Hebrew. And I'm Docs, editor, question asker, and voice of Hermit. And this has been Bright on Buddhism. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, or if you have a question you'd like us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you. Please consider leaving a comment or review, subscribing, or joining us on social media. Email us at bright.on.buddhism at gmail.com, or tweet us at brightbuddhism. As always, citations and resources for this episode can be found in the show notes. Thank you.